Well, my name is Lewis, um, and I've been, uh, I guess, we just wrapped up a, a three-year study on soil sensors uh, here at Farming Smarter. So I remember, I think at our conference about a year and a half ago, Ken asked me to talk for about, I think, seven to ten minutes about this project, and I didn't know how I was going to fill seven to ten minutes, because at that point we had done very little analysis, um, but lots of field work. So today my problem was the opposite. I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to contain myself to ten minutes, so... We'll see, we'll see how it goes. So the project kind of, the whole project starts with the soil sensors themselves. So we were able to obtain uh, Varus and EM38 machines, and both of them, they measure soil conductivity. Um, and with, with the GPS, we can kind of go through the fields and map that conductivity as we go through. So um, we found very early in the study that our, both the Varus and the EM38 were highly, highly accurate and highly effective for measuring conductivity and we found that the soil samples we took concurrently as we mapped the fields showed that we were highly accurate to where we had a good idea where the presence of clay was and the presence of soil moisture, as well as our measured conductivity. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was, that was a good start for it, but what we really wanted to know was how well we could better understand variability in the fields using soil sensors, and if we could use that information to make management decisions. So the next step was to take any layer of information that we could attain and kind of put it, mix it all together and see which layers were going to be useful for us and if we could use those to make management decisions. So we brought together any layers of information that we could gather. The, the, various, the model of the various that we had had the capacity to map pH as well as organic matter through the field at the same time as measuring EC. Now we also, we also gathered elevation maps, historic yield maps, um, NDVI in a couple of cases. So any layers of data that we could get our hands on. So here's a few examples of maps that we, we built. And if I flip back and forth through them, you can see there's some, some similarities in the spatial patterns um, in different layers, but they might tell us different things. So we wanted to go through and have an objective means of determining which layers of information were really gonna help us so that we weren't to choosing two layers of information that essentially reflected the same patterns and told us the same things. So we took all our layers of information and we used a statistical procedure that helped us identify which layers were going to be those key layers, the ones that we really wanted to focus on moving forward. And what we came up with was historic yield and conductivity were two layers that each brought something different to the table, told us a little bit something different about the variability in the fields. So we kind of keyed in on those as we moved forward. So in order to test different methods of zone delineation or different strategies to manage variability, we used five different methods of zone delineation. So we did surface geography, which is basically, it really wasn't any more complex than drawing, using a paint program, looking at surface features and, and drawing zones on the basis of that. So it was a really coarse first step um, and it gave us a bit of a baseline to which we could co compare some more complicated uh, methods. Uh, the second, we used grid soil samples, so we did a five-acre grid, so we sampled, uh, took a sample every five acres, and we used that, the information we got from there, to develop zones. And then we used historic yield, electrical conductivity, and our final method combined that yield and conductivity. So here's, here's just some of the examples uh, for one of the fields we mapped. We did map ten fields across the province. So surface geography, and then we nested it into a grid geography grid soil samples, and that's what our zones look like there, historic yield, conductivity, and our composite, which was yield and EC. So we came up with five different methods of delineating zones, and we tested all five in 10 different fields. And the way we tested them was each field we seeded with a variable nitrogen trial. So five different rates, or, or a range of rates of nitrogen, it wasn't always five, was applied to each field. So 0, 75, 100, 125, and 150 pounds of nitrogen seeded into the field. And then at the end of the season, we harvested this field and kept, that, uh, kept the yield map from, from harvesting the field. So that let us know, so for each area of the field, what the rate of nitrogen was applied and what that area um, yielded. So use, doing, um, designing our study this way allowed us to take all of our zone delineation methods and we could draw them onto this trial. So we could draw, in this case, surface geography. We could, oops. We could draw that right onto our, our, our variable nitrogen trial. 
So then we could take each zone, um, each zone on its own and look at, so in this case, we can look at what the yield was where we had zone blue and zero pounds of nitrogen, 75, 100, 125, and 150, and come up with a response curve that looks something like this. Um, so that shows that how, how the yield in that zone responded to increasing rates of nitrogen. So each delineation, we came up with a range of zones, and, and I'm gonna focus on this, uh, the, the yield response to historic yield. And this is kind of something we, we saw pretty typically. So like I said before, there was two things we were looking for. One was if the, if the zones we delineated, if they yielded differently from one another, that would indicate that we built zones that were effective, that they did say something about soil properties and their ability to influence yield. And the second thing we were looking for was if we responded to, to those range of rates differently. So in this one, we see that we've got the, the average yield level for each zone, which is represented by each curve, is different. So the green yield, the green zone, out yielded the red zone, out yielded the blue zone. So the zones that we've come up with here are saying something meaningful about the productivity in the field. But if we look at the shape of these curves, they're not meaningfully different from one another. So that indicates that there's not a different optimal rate for each of these zones. There's not an, an ideal rate for each zone that's different from one another. So this chart here, this kind of shows us um, the results on a global scale across the whole project. So the, the, the yellow part of the bars, that shows us where we had complete success, where all three zones were different from one another from a production standpoint. And the red, or the blue shows us where two zones were different but the third wasn't, and the red is where there was no success. All three zones weren't different from one another. And you can see that we had quite a bit of success in identifying zones that produced differently from one another. So, and our, on the far right, that's our composite, our EC and yield. So delineating zones by that method, we had the most success. We, there was no instances where we weren't able to, to differentiate productivity at all. When it came to identifying different management strategies for each zone or a different ideal rate, we had much less success. In fact, in, in almost all instances, we weren't able to find statistically different responses to nitrogen, which makes it, which shows that it would be a challenge to manage those zones differently from a nitrogen input standpoint. So really, to conclude, we, we found that the EC sensors were a pretty effective tool for, for understanding variability in the field. Um, and as we went through the study, we found that coming up with, with good, strong yield data was a real challenge, but EC might be an effective alternative to that. It might be easier and more effective to you know, hire somebody to, to, to do an EC map of your field than to try to maintain good yield data year after year and, and assume that they're, like for example, a hailstorm can really throw off a yield map. That's gonna change your yield pattern in a field. So EC was a pretty effective tool. And we did, we did have a lot of success identifying zones that produced differently from one another. But, we, but it was certainly a challenge to find a different management strategy for each, each, um, <clears throat> for each zone. So at the end of the day, the different methods had different levels of success in different fields. And so if you're, if you're looking at getting into to variable rate or um, zone delineation and, and managing variability, it's, it's good to keep in mind that every field is different. So a different strategy might be di appropriate for a different field. So at the end of the day, um, variable rate strategies, they're not universal, but they are testable. So you can go in and check and see how effective each strategy was. So with that, um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. just wondering, was that minus, if you're on this project, so is it, where, where are we at? Are you completed that? Yeah, yeah, so the project, the project is completed. We're just um, finishing up the final report, so. Okay, yeah. no, no plans for? Well, we're kind of, we're kind of working through where to go next with the, with the, yeah, in this field, but uh, at this point, we haven't, we haven't put in an application yet, so we'll get this one tied up and then see where we're going next, I think. So just one more question, yeah. on the organic matter sensor, was it, how was the pH in organic matter? Well, one of the, 
we did have challenges with the pH sensor. So our study wasn't designed to measure point on point accuracy of those sensors, but we did find that our measurements were highly consistent. So all the fields were mapped at two times. So our pH map from time one was highly consistent. The pattern was highly consistent to map in, in time two. So that tells us something about the pH sensor. Um, the organic matter sensor, we, we did have some logistical problems with the, man, or the organic matter sensor. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an optical sensor. Um, and it, it gets right in, right on the soil. And we often had that sight glass crack on us. So there's questions as to the accuracy of those organic matter readings. But so tough for me to comment on how well. But, but operationally, it was a bit of a challenge sometimes, depending on you know, the, how much rocks in the field that we were mapping. So. Uh, that's something, that's one of the next steps we're kind of working towards. So we've got a, a research scientist on, on contract, and that's one of the things we're going to be looking at uh, putting together in the next year or so. Yeah? Overall timelines, like if a producer were to do all this work himself, how much time do you think you took just to do this portion of it? You know, uh, to, to do the maps and delineate the zones was a pretty big time commitment on our part. But we, we, we went through some st um, statistical methods just to, to kind of make sure we did things right. That would take us a lot more time than, than maybe a producer would. But I think, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to give you a, a number on it, but it's, it is a lot of work. Like I think um, not only to develop zones, to, but then to go in and test them and see how effective they are. It's a lot of work and, and designing an, uh, a field scale trial and adhering to that trial. So, that's, that's a lot of work too. That's, that's a real challenge to make sure that comes, comes together and you get good yield data and everything, so. That's a big project on the Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. So you're doing, you're doing uh, full, you did full fields, so like Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, quarter sections. Yeah, 10 fields, they were all full, full 160 acres. So to do a quarter section took us about four, four hours, so. Yeah, about four hours, but it, it, it would depend. So we did the Varus and the EM38 together. If you were to do the EM38 on its own, it's, it's much smaller, so you could probably pull it behind a quad and, and go a little bit faster, but the Varus, it's, it's a contact sensor, so it's got those six disks, and they've got to maintain contact with the soil at all times, so then you're a little bit slower. So I think if, if, if somebody were to use just the EM38 on its own, you could probably speed things up a little, but for, for us it was about four hours for a field. Four hours of just collecting the data, and then probably a, a little bit of time cleaning it out and whatever in the office after. So. Uh, join me in thanking Lewis.